You looking real cute, Tasha. You looking super cute, right you? <laughs> Anywho, welcome oh. back, y'all. <laughs> we go back like four flats on the Cadillac. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Diving back. Side the rooftop. Uh, digging Dang, in the scene with the gangsta lean. Gangsta white. So I hope y'all are all caught up on season one of Blood Sisters podcast. Now, before you continue to listen to this episode, be sure to like, comment and subscribe to our YouTube, Facebook and Instagram pages. Now, we are under the name Blood Sisters with a Z. If you're looking to follow us on Instagram, you can find us at Blood Sisters with a Z podcast. Now, as always, I am here with my two peopleicious people, Rachel and Christy. Hi, I missed you so much. I'm feeling peopleicious. Peopleicious. <laughs> now, how y'all doing today? Mm. I'm fab. Just, just great. Yeah. Absolutely fab. Now, we had two weeks off, as you guys know. We're sorry. Mm-hmm. We know y'all missed us. Um, do you ladies do anything fun over our little vacation? Hell yeah. What you do, girl? I uh, I had got tested for COVID. Oh shit! Ooh, I tested. Huh? I tested negative. There you go. Um, I lost my sense of taste and smell. That's why I tested for it in the first place. Oh, cute. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to a Halloween party when I found out I tested negative. So responsible of me, right? Anyway, um, I did. Um, I was cute though, like a millennial. Like we got negative <laughs> tests. Time to turn up. Time to turn up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to a Halloween party. It was really, really nice. Um, I was a. Uh, I wasn't necessarily a, a, a character this year. I was a uh, a phrase. Mm-hmm. You ever heard the phrase, ain't no fun when a rabbit's got the gun? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was the rabbit with the gun. Uh, it was nice. I, I, I designed my entire costume by myself. Um, and and I just cooked Thanksgiving dinner. It was so amazing. I finally got my yams to taste like my sister's. And they're like, absolutely mm-hmm. good. How did yeah. you make them? Um, like- my sister said that she put them in the oven uh, mm-hmm. this time around. And I'm just like, what you mean the oven? And so I put them in the oven like she told me. And except for I had put a little orange juice. In, oh, in so my- it was like a casserole? Not really. It was like- just I just I just cooked them in the oven. Okay. It wasn't necessarily casserole ish. OK, it wasn't. I didn't mash them or anything. I just layered them with the uh, the sugar and uh, spices. Mm. Um, and the orange juice, and and that's it, okay. and, and the butter. Mm-hmm. If you forget the butter, that shit gonna forget burn. Forget about it. But <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it was it was really good. But the orange juice make it taste really good. It nice. does. Yes. Just a little bit of orange juice goes a long way. I have way, way too much food left though. <laughs> like I don't know what in Ugh. the hell I was thinking. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I, it's it's a lot of food left. Yeah. I don't know who I was cooking for. You Rachel. and Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Barry didn't even eat. Oh, he went Barry. to bed. I haven't made him a couple of drinks, and I think I had overdid it with with Bacardi. Oh, Poe Berry. <laughs> Christina, what did you do for our little break? Um, well, we had Thanksgiving. I was originally going to go to my sister's, but with COVID surging and everything, uh, we decided mm-hmm. to just stay home and made a, a turkey. The only turkey we could find at the store was like a 20 some pound turkey mm. so we still have a whole ass turkey <laughs> but it was kind of cool because usually having thanksgiving with the family i i don't get a drumstick right. but this year i got to have a whole damn whole leg i got a turkey right. leg i felt like a viking i was like <laughs> hell yeah i'm gonna pillage your town and i'm gonna eat this turkey leg with some ketchup and hot sauce Ooh. all right well, for me, I didn't do anything fun. Um, I'm finally with Corona. You know, a lot of us have lost our jobs. I'm finally back working. So I just been Ooh. spending our little break. Yes. Heck yeah. Won't she do it? Holla, holla, holla. Um, <laughs> I've just been working and I am not complaining about it because once you've been out of work for a few months, you're just like, please just give me something to do and pay mm-hmm. me pennies for it. Um, so I'm happy y'all good. Now, for last season, we covered, of course, there were 10 episodes and we ended up covering 12 different serial killers, if I'm not mistaken. Cause yeah, because we threw three in. Yeah. Yeah, because we're the shit. All we right. are the okay. shit. You're welcome. So out of everyone that we covered last season, ladies, who's your favorite and why? We can go through that quick. Mm. Ooh, it would have to be the tea maker only because mm. I just couldn't. <laughs> I'm still laughing. I don't think it's funny. It's funny. 
mm-hmm. that she was making tea cakes with <laughs> with folks. Like, okay. and then talking about some. Oh, she with was folks. tasty. Mm, right. And, and and then the soap. Like, yeah. yes, go ahead and wash up with this bitch. Mm-hmm. Um, Got to get clean. because because maybe because it was she, her way. Of she got to go cleaning right. her sins from herself. She felt like she was washing them away. She, you you thought she was cleaning the sins <laughs> with the sin. Maybe maybe that was her. <laughs> got uh, it. Got it. Was her I think that of, was my. I think she was my favorite though. Okay, yeah. Christina, who's your favorite? I think my favorite was Nanny Doss just because mm. that was the very <laughs> first one. Your favorite. That was the very first one we did. We were all so like excited to start this journey on this podcast adventure. Yes. Um, we had the pre-recorded giggles, which were ridiculous. Our reenactment was so fun, and um, it was it was fun as hell, and it just kickstarted our whole. Our whole show. Now for me, damn it, you took mine, Nanny oh, Doss. Shit, I'm sorry, because <laughs> it was it was the first. Oh, I'm choking on the air, y'all. Hold on now. All um, right. It was the first All episode. Right. Nine one one, someone right. please call nine one one. Just give me another shot of whiskey. <laughs> um, so, but it was it was fun for me because it was our first one. Like, and we were we came in so nervous, but the energy was so high, and also because I I had so much in common with Nanny Doss. In the terms of if I were to be a killer, I would target my lovers and I would be happy about it. So I, I just I related to Nanny Doss of all of the female serial killers we talked about the most. I liked her. We should bring back Speaking the giggles. Speaking of Nanny, yes. Um, mm-hmm. I had a, uh, a listener tell me that she really enjoyed the giggles and, and we should do something like that for every episode. Mm. That's what she said. That would be really cool. We would just have to figure out something clever. Yeah, something like that idea. Yeah, she said. Yeah. She said. She said something. She said that was so funny because I was really trying to figure out who giggled what. Like, I think we should do that. So I will let you guys know too for this season. What we are going to be consistent with is timing. So we realize that some of our shows are a little too long. So we're gonna start. Um, we were just trying to give you the four one one. Right. We're trying to get y'all all right? everything all the four and, and not, not miss out on information. But we're gonna probably be cutting some corners so that we can keep it to a more more consistent time for you guys we understand an hour and a half of one show is a lot of time for anybody <laughs> yeah unless you're like yeah. you know that you have that time blocked yeah. off and you're gonna be able to listen to the whole thing yep yep it's just not feasible i mean why well, be people. ready in my tub with you know my bath yeah bombs right and, you know, everything so if, if we miss some some important information <laughs> understand it's because we're all trying to make sure that we cut down how, how much we speak in each section so we can just get out the nitty-gritty for y'all right we're trying to make nice little bites of information for your palate, mm. if you will. I Ooh, like that. I got like turned that. On. Wait a mm. minute now. Oh. Bites for your palate. Let me suck my tongue. Bites for your palate, mm-hmm. bitch. I, oh, I can't cuss this season. Okay. Um, yes, we can. Because I, I heard we don't get paid. We'll talk about it off the air. Okay. We have the explicit <laughs> thing on here. It says E next to it. Okay, perfect, perfect. It now, says E next ex- to we're it. We're explicit. <laughs> So for today, y'all, we are talking about a notorious man that many don't know of. So mm-hmm. for some reason, he is not listed with the greats. When we think of like Dahmer, Gein, Kemper, uh, Ramirez, he's not listed in this list of greats. Because even when I heard his name, I was just like, I don't think I've heard about him. Right. Who the hell is and this? And I talked to some people. I was like, y'all know this guy? And they're like, I've never heard of him. He's not listed. And I've never heard of him either. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because one of the uh, articles I read, he was actually referred to as the forgotten serial Serial killer. Yes. Yeah. And so the chameleon. So funny. Yes. So in true uh, Blood Sisters fashion, we going to put y'all on game real quick about our boy. Now, I've always struggled with this when white people spell S-T-E-P-H-E-N. I always right. want to say Stefan, but it's Stephen. Right. I don't <laughs> get it Stephen. either. <laughs> so we're going to put y'all on to Stephen Peter Morin. All right. Okay. So. Yeah. Stephen Peter Morin is literally the forgotten serial killer, even though he totally killed motherfuckers. I mean, people. Sorry. He totally did kill people. But he's forgotten. And I, one of my theories about that, you know, I'm going to be your theorist for this season. Apparently. Look. <laughs> anyway, I really feel like it's because um, these people just weren't of any importance to to their family members, friends, or anything like that. You know, anyway. But Stephen was born February 19th, 1951 in Providence, Rhode Island, into a poor family. <clears throat> um, I couldn't find anything about his mother mm. or father. Sisters, mm. brothers, nothing. Mm. 
So I don't understand like how he's so forgotten and why he's so lost in the system. But it's probably because of um, some information I'm going to give you later on. Um, but he was a little shit. I'll tell you that much. Peter, well, uh, uh, St- uh, Stephen Peter was just a little shit. He dropped out of school super early. He started doing drugs. He he was a nuisance. So, I mean, his parents was probably irritated with him and probably didn't care much. Depending, saying that he's like poor, they, they probably didn't care. They probably didn't even know. Um, but at 15, he was convicted um, and spent some time in an in, um, institution for juvenile delinquents for two years for stealing a car. And then in 1972, he did the exact same thing, except mm. for this car had LSD in it. I told mm-hmm. you he was a little shit. Okay. It had LSD in it. And he only spent five years probation for that uh, a crime, the LSD and the stolen car. See, that's that damn privilege. Mm-hmm. I feel that. You know, because yeah. cause, cause had Stephen been black and had did that, he would have been seen as much more he dangerous. Been in, he, he would have been in jail, him. okay, damn near under it, mm. okay? So, whatever. Um, in 1976, though, he moved to San Francisco where he, like, consistently changed his identity. And so, and that's why I feel like he is the, he's the forgotten and lost a serial killer because he changed his identity so much. So it's, it's no telling like who he was at what point when he did anything mm-hmm. because he changed his identity so much. So like I said, he was a little shit. <laughs> he probably was doing all kinds of stuff. Little and shit. we have, he, we have absolutely no idea about it because he kept changing his identity and he was almost like, it was like he was an orphan to the world. Right. <clears throat> no one knew who he was. Do you was. think he just needed like a good spanking or? What? Hardy har har, Christina. Because I know you being out on funny jobs at this point. Right. I, right. I know she's being. I know she's being funny. I can see it in her face. No, I, <laughs> I just mean like when he was a kid. Like maybe if he would have put been put in his place, like you need to respect people. Right. But but no one cared. I I, I thought that too. No mm. one cared. No teachers. His family parents nobody gave a shit you think shit. they just saw him as like a lost cause and i just, think so because he dropped whatever. out so early and then he dropped 15, out early he, he doing what he wanted to do in a car he got out and four years later did the same thing i don't think anybody cared for peter right now he didn't care Damn. no one cared they were just like whatever man you oh by bullshit. the way he goes by peter guys so we probably won't refer to him as yeah. steven he goes by peter a lot that's so. why i called him peter but yeah <laughs> yeah peter don't give a shit so christina mm. Ugh. tell us why he's still a little shit. He is still a little shit because he continued his fucking crimes uh, well into the rest of his life. So, as Rachel said, 1976, he moves to San Francisco where he really starts taking on those traits that makes him the chameleon. He would change his identity by researching men around his age who had recently passed. He would then scam his way into getting their information, such as their birth certificate social security card, and would actually change his appearance so that he could take on their identity. The same year, he was arrested in San Rafael in California for possession of a syringe and resisting arrest. However, he used a fake identity in this case, so he was only sentenced to one year of probation. Mm -hmm. Other names that he would eventually use throughout his lifetime are Rich Clark, Ray Constantino, and Thomas David Hones. <laughs> Not Hones. He right. was very That's creative. <laughs> so, this is where the crimes go from drugs and stealing cars to hurting women. It's September of that same year, uh, Morin kidnapped and raped a 14-year-old girl who was a supposed family friend. He lured her into his apartment and put gauze in her mouth and tape across her eyes. He cut her shirt off of her and stripped her naked. After she was naked, he gave her a pair of shorts to wear, but she did not fit into them. Mm. Mm-hmm. Morin told the 14-year-old girl that he would cut her skin away until she fit into them. What? He then tied her to ropes and placed a belt around her neck in a way where if she tried to move, the belt would tighten around her neck so she couldn't move. She was raped repeatedly and claims that she attempted to kill herself during the ordeal by holding her breath. Um, after this crime, he was officially added to the federal most wanted list. Mm, mm, mm. Mm-hmm. After this, he moves to Las Vegas, Nevada. 
and he meets his future wife, who is working as a school teacher named Sylvia. She would know him as Robert Generoso. Oh, I love that name. So that whole, I know, right? So mm. the whole time she's married to this man, she thinks that he is Robert Generoso, and she becomes Sylvia Generoso. Ooh, ain't that about mm-hmm. a B word? Mm-hmm. While visiting so his wife, So she's a fake family. person, pretty much. Right, and she doesn't even know and it. she don't even know it. Nope. Right, okay. Keep your name and identity, ladies. Don't change your mm-hmm. name for no man. Hell no, I will <laughs> never change my name. I also, I love my last name. It's a beautiful name. Mata. Beautiful it name. means to kill, and oh, I shit. like that. See, that's how <laughs> y'all know it. she shouldn't get married. Anyway, mm-hmm. Christina. For real. Okay. While visiting his wife's family in Connecticut, Morin toured Yale's library, where he be- he again searched obituaries for men of similar ages who recently passed, obtaining more identities. Morin was then arrested in Pleasanton, California, for pulling a gun on two men during an altercation. Again, he gave an alias to police and was released on a five hundred dollar bail. Now this goes to show you too how how much of a ticking time bomb he, he is. You argue with somebody and just up pistol, right? Like, <laughs> you don't go from like let's be a peer mediator, let's figure out this altercation together. Pull out a pistol. as men, like I'm just gonna pull out a pistol. You know what? Let's solve this right here with my gun. Like how dumb are you? Oh my god. Anyway, oh my. So, January 26th of 1979, uh, 16-year-old Kim Bryant is abducted from the parking lot of a Dairy Queen across the street from her school. Mm. Her body is found on February 20th, 1979, in the desert on the west side of Vegas by three hikers. They spotted a police car and flagged it down. Kim was hit in the head several times with a rock, and she was found nude from the waist down. Detectives believe that she was alive for about four days after her disappearance, which is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. She was not, he was not charged with this murder, but it is suspected that he was the main suspect in the case. So he killed somebody for Mm -hmm. his birthday? Because he was born February 18th. Maybe. So you killed somebody for your birthday? Are you crazy? Her her body was found on, found on February 20th. 20th, Correct. But she disappeared on January 26th. Mm Mm-hmm. And if she was alive for four days, that would have mean her murder took place on January 30th. 30th, right. Okay. So so you're going to start your birthday month off killing people? Mm. Maybe. Okay. Maybe. Mm-hmm. maybe he, he celebrates in fucked up ways. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's really. Happy birthday okay. to me. It's, yeah. Who knows? Mm. Who knows what he was thinking, right? In 1980, Stephen conducts another murder in january he abducts 18 year old susan Belot. she was leaving work and never made it home i did read that susan worked in a pet clinic and that she may have met steven while he came in to the clinic with a dog so he was married at this time to sylvia so it's possible that it could have been the family dog or something like that Mm. um her body was found a few months later in bloomington hills utah by some kids who were rabbit hunting. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Not the babies. Not the babies. Uh, she was found clothed, but detectives think that she was dressed post-mortem. She was raped and strangled. Mm. Mm-hmm. After this, Susan's friend, Crystal, then starts getting followed by a strange man and thinks that it might have been Susan's killer. So, for example, she ended up having to walk into work ended up having to walk to work because her car wouldn't start. Mm. So she takes her car to the mechanic. And after she takes the car in, she's like, well, I'm just going to walk to work. So while walking, a black trans am starts following her. And the driver was furiously masturbating in her general direction. Mm. Mm -hmm. She then uh, later on, she went to a party with some friends and was given a drink that made her sleepy, but luckily she went with friends who took her home. Of course, this might not have been Morin, but it is said that after Stephen Morin's picture was shown in the media, she immediately recognized him as the man in the Trans Am and the man at the party. Mm. It's very possible that it could have been him. Um, This kind of seems to be a, a thing of his to kill someone and then start a fascination with that victim's friend or acquaintance. 
Um, Natasha is actually going to talk about the next two victims and their story because she was actually the one who found this next story and told us about it, piquing our interest in Stephen Morin and leading us to taking on this dude. Buckle up, B-words. All Mm. right. Now, we decided to research because I was watching this episode on Hulu. I said Holo. Hulu. (laughs) Holo. That's a new one. (laughs) Uh, On Hulu, I suggest everyone look into, and it's called Obsession Dark Desires. Now, this show comes in hot talking about Peter during episode one. So there's this woman, Sarah Peasen. I may mispronounce her last name. She works at a gas station with Cheryl Daniels, right? Now, she had just moved to Vegas with her three daughters at the age of 19 after a nasty divorce, and she is excited when she finds uh, employment at the gas station. Now, we'll mention that she had all three of her girls by the age of 16. I know. Yes. None of them were twins. Oh my goodness. All all three of them by the age of 16. She was married. She's going through a divorce by 19. Mm -hmm. Now, she, um, the entire time, she's witnessing her friend Cheryl, who they all call Sherry. She's being picked up from work. She's coming back the next day. She's floating on air. She's excited about this new man that she's dating. Mm -hmm. Actually, on uh, Sarah's first day of working with Sherry, Sherry came in late because she took the night off to go on a first date with her soon-to-be boo. So when the ladies tried to meet um, Sherry's new man, she kept saying, like, well, he's a loner. He doesn't really want to meet new people. Y'all can't meet him. Uh-huh. He's shy. Yeah. He, I don't want to bring him in here, right? <laughs> uh-huh. so, but she kept going on and on about how much of a gentleman he was. So the lady's like, okay, she got a good one. He just, uh, he, you know, he stand off. That's cool. Mm-hmm. So one day he picks her up um, and Sarah talks about how he stood outside of the car just staring at her and how it made her so uncomfortable. Now, it, no words. He's just staring her the, the entire time like a piece of meat so one day Cheryl Sherry comes back she's all distraught you know she got tears in her eyes ladies like girl what's wrong nothing girl what's wrong nothing Mm -hmm. so she finally like girl tell us what's going on he's married okay are you happy she gets mad and walks out she finds out that her her boo thing is actually he's he's married so the next oh go ahead baby you got something to say oh I was just going to say during this time when Sherry is dating this man he's going by the name of Andrew Ireland yeah I said I got that later yep okay my, okay. no that's my I should have said in the beginning you right you so keep that because that's actually a key part yep. Andrew Ireland is mm-hmm. what she knows him as now this story gets a little confusing so make sure y'all remember that right keep track keep track <laughs> of all these names now the next day Sherry's a no call no show she go missing everybody like where the hell Sherry at the cops find her jeep the next day in a shopping center just abandoned now, six weeks after her disappearance, Sarah gets a promotion because Sherry and them went missing, right? So now Sarah's the new manager. She gets a beeper so the uh, the owner can always contact her whenever he needs to talk to her. Mm-hmm. So there's a customer that she meets, Robert Generoso. <laughs> the one and only. The one oh. and only, Robert oh. Generoso. Okay. He's always interested in taking her on a date. Every day you see, like, you the new manager. Let me holler at you. She's like, oh, uh-huh. hmm. No, I'm fine. I just moved here. I'm not looking for anything serious. I'm a single mom. I'm busy. Mm, I'm busy. I'm busy. Yeah. Right. So again, this is now. Now we're at four months after Sherry's disappearance, and he keeps um, he keeps trying to be persistent, and, and Sarah keeps pushing him off. Now on this beeper, Sherry Sarah actually tells a story about how one day she got out of the shower, and he someone beeping her. We don't know who it is at this point, mm-hmm. and it's like you look good in a towel. Yep. The fuck? How you know I'm in a towel? Right. So then it moves on and he starts telling her all the nasty things he'll do to her. And he even ends up masturbating on one of the calls. He even goes on to say, like, I'm going to tie you up and cut you up. Right now. Back to Robert Generoso. Mm. And and feel free to jump in whenever you want to, Christina. Okay, okay. I know he's he did say the first beeper message that she got was you look good in a towel. Mm-hmm. And then she was like, what the hell? Her apartment was apparently on the second floor. She, so she had really had no idea how he was able to see this. Yes. And um, shortly after that first message, she got another one that says, why don't you just drop the towel for me? So mm. she's like, crazy. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Creepy. Creepy. So Robert, get back to Generoso. This whole time he's still pursuing her at the gas station, right? Mm. I'm giving y'all the quick version. <laughs> she eventually, y'all really have to watch the show because I'm skipping over some stuff. She eventually gives in and says, cool, call me. You can take me out. He calls the gas station 15 minutes later. He like, what about tomorrow, baby girl? Let's hang out tomorrow. She like, mm-hmm. fine, whatever. That's cool. So before they hang up, he ends up saying, I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. And she was caught off guard. So she goes ahead and gives him her address. I Mm -hmm. mean, he already knew the address, right? 
But she goes ahead and gives him her address and says, you know, you can pick me up at this time. Yep. So uh, once they hang up the phone, she gets a gut feeling. Her intuition, women intuition always go with that. Mm -hmm. Something tells her, I shouldn't go on this date. She got a weird vibe. Creeping me out. Yep. So she decides the next day, she's like, all right. I'm going to stay at work even later because he's at he's meeting me at my house. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to stay at work. And in the reenactment, she just kept looking at the clock like, you think he going yet? No, nah, he ain't going yet. I'm going to stay here and keep on working. Right. Mm-hmm. So the next night, because she, she misses the, the date, of course. Now, the next night he come back to her job. He's pissed. His truck come barreling at her so fast she had to jump out of the way so that he didn't end up hitting her. Right. So the ladies, the, the one woman around her, she's like, I'm going to call the cops. And Sarah locks the door. She's like, no, I, I got it. I got it. I got it. So she's trying to talk him down, like, calm down, calm down. He hops out. He calling her names. He's like, I had plans. I made a ma- arrangements. Where were you, you whore? I got money. Is it what money you want? You whore. He throwing money at the screen like she a stripper and stuff. What He's throwing it into the hell? attendant booth yes. at her. Like, is it money that you want? Throwing hundreds at her into the booth. I would have picked it up after he left. But right anyway, after he left, right I would have picked it up. Oh, I'd be you. like, well, this kids. is worth my strife. I'll, I'll take that. Yeah. So he keeps telling her, like, you you, you ruined everything. You ruined everything. I'm mad at you. I'm beat you up. Blah, blah, blah. So now the beeper calls, they, they get worse at this point, right? This mm-hmm. mystery man. He starts talking about how he going to beat her. He going to rape her. I'm going to cut you up. I'm going to kill you. And it went from him just speaking to now she's hearing on the beeper a woman being beaten, screaming while she's being tortured. He would actually call the the beeper and and clearly lay it down in front of whoever he's torturing so Sarah could hear all of this. So, again, I'm missing some parts. The the show is called Obsession Dark Desires on Hulu. Hulu, you got... I keep saying Hulu. Hulu. It's for the uh, ID network. ID network. the ID network. Just incredibly entertaining. Now, Christina mentioned earlier how he was known to kill a woman, then stalk someone in her life. Mm -hmm. Now, it is discovered that the woman that he had been torturing, or we assume, I should say, wasn't discovered. Mm -hmm. We assume it was Cheryl Daniels. And when Cheryl Daniels' body was found found in the uh, desert, Mm -hmm. she had a wallet on her with the name and address of Sarah inside. Now, when the police, actually, I don't want to skip around. Did you want to say anything else about that? Um, Sarah started hearing what sounds like a woman screaming and crying and getting beaten. Sarah still hasn't mentioned this issue and has not said anything to her boss about what the messages say. She's still new to her managerial position and does not want to really complain or do anything to jeopardize her job or integrity. So she just kind of keeps it quiet. Mm -hmm. Um, With all this going on and with the creep Robert Generoso now knowing where she lives, she actually decides to move. So she moves during that time. So I will say, too, before she moves, so the police call her and they're like, hey, you need to go and hide. And so the police Mm -hmm. end up showing her a book of um, suspects, she thinks. And so it takes her a while to register. The cops say, does this man look familiar? She flipping through the page is like, wait, this is one person? Mm-hmm. And so he would easily go in his, his disguises, his aliases, he would go from a white man to a Mexican man. So Sarah flipping through the books like, wait, this is this uh, Cheryl boyfriend. Wait, this is my, this is Robert. Like, whoa, are you telling me this is one guy? Yep. She's freaking out at this point. Yeah. And she actually said that then they start showing her pictures of the, his victims. Yeah. And it actually matched some of the things that he said he would do to her. Like he told her, I'm going to cut your eyes out and have sex with your skull. One of the women that they showed her had her eyes removed. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um, absolutely. They, they call her from work, tell her to hide herself while the cops get there. Um, she goes into the back room and waits for the cops to get there. They look through the folder of pictures. Um, she recognizes two men. She's like, yeah, Robert Generoso, and that's Andrew Ireland. And then her mind explodes a little, I'm sure, when the cops tell her that all the pictures are of the same man. He's able to look Hispanic. He's able to look Indian. He has that kind of face where he can just kind of change himself and look however he wants. Mm. Um, there's a lot more to the Sarah Paisan story, which can be found on, as uh, Natasha said, it can be found on ID Network's Obsession Dark Desires. Go to Hulu. Uh, which you can find on Hulu. <laughs> um, it's literally the first episode of the first season. So feel free to dig in and watch some more episodes if you like. I know that I started binge watching it and I am on like season two, episode seven right now. And a lot of them are really entertaining. 
um, the star- the stories are good, but a lot of the reenactments are really good too. So by this time, Stephen and his wife were separated and he told Sylvia, his wife, that he was leaving Vegas. He was probably well aware that the police were looking for him at this time and he skipped town. It's suspected that he went to Hawaii. So he would continue to call his wife during this time, asking for updates on the case and insisting that he was being set up. Mm -hmm. Likely story. He would then spend a few more years traveling and scheming. He made his way back to the States and would go to Louisiana for a time where he would work as a machinist. Um, He also spent a lot of time getting work as a painter, which really reminded me of Albert Fish. (laughs) Albert Fish was a painter. Fishy poo. Right. Fishy poo. Um, he then met a woman named Brita Xavier in New York. She owned an antique shop and introduced himself to her as Ray, Ray Constantino. Mm. He charmed his way into her life and Rita's 21 year old son, Chris Clark did not approve. And I'll have more on him in a little bit. Ray ends up moving in like literally a day after he meets her. Where, where's a good place for me to find an apartment around here? And he ends up just charming his way into her life and he moves in. He ends up getting a job as a union painter and vouches for Rita's son, Chris, so that they can work together. And they get along pretty well that summer and they work together as union painters. Ray eventually convinced Rita to sell her business so that they could buy a van and travel the country together. I don't know if that sounds romantic or what, but doesn't sound very romantic to me. She had no idea that they would be traveling the country so that he can find more victims. They would stay in a city for a few days and he would disappear while she waited for him in a hotel. He would then come back and say as soon as he came back that they need to leave right away. In November of 1981, he kills Sheila Ann Whalen in Denver, Colorado. She's a 23-year-old waitress from the Denver area and her naked body is found on November 7th in a motel room. Mm. A warrant would be out for his arrest, but it was under the name rich Clark. Sheila's father, Joseph Whalen. Actually, I did some more research on Sheila. I was trying to find more info on her and found that her father, Joseph Whalen is an artist and retired art teacher who makes art geared towards stopping the abuse of women. Um, I found an article on him on buffalonews.com from July 23rd of this year. So it was very recent. Um, A part of a quote from him in the article as he's referring to his art reads, we are all given levels of intellect and maybe some of this will get through to people who think they have a right to physically abuse people to satisfy their own egos or frustrations or problems. There's more to it if you want to look it up and give it a read. The article is called... Local artist uses his art to stop abuse of women. So after his daughter's killed, he kind of dedicates his life to to that cause. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I just want to go back a little bit and talk about Rita's son, Chris Clark, for a moment. He spent years with this man as a part of his family, and he wrote a really interesting piece on his experience with Morin. Um, So I just want to mention a few things here. Um. If you Google Stephen Morin and Chris Clark, um, you'll be able to find the the piece that he wrote about him. Uh, just a couple memories of things that he shared in that article I want to share with everybody. He had found out that his mother had ordered a copy of his birth certificate to give to Ray, a.k.a. Morin, so that he could get an ID with his name on it. And I will read this over. Um, He found out that his mother had ordered a copy of my birth certificate to give to Ray so that he could get an ID with a different name on it. I intercepted it in what was likely the luckiest moment of my life. So apparently he was open with Rita and told her, you know, I want to get an ID with Chris's name on it. Can I get a copy of his birth certificate and she went ahead and did it Mm. somehow chris intercepted it bless bless his heart i don't know 
he was going to try to use his alias. It's weird that she wouldn't catch on to that and think this is a red flag. This isn't Mm -hmm. good. You know, why are you trying to use my son's identity? Another one is just before um, Ray and his mother left for their trip cross country in the van. Um, I'm just going to read what I have here in the article. I wandered by her house one humid night. I'd moved out to my own place, what with my union paycheck, and found Ray sweating, attaching carpet to the walls and ceiling of the van. He was struggling to hold the carpet up as he put rivets into metal. I stepped up and helped him. So he didn't really understand at the time, but he was helping Ray to soundproof that van so that he could have the victims in there to mm-hmm. rape, murder, and he didn't know at the time. He just thought he was helping Ray, but he was helping him to soundproof that van. Right. So eventually they are on their cross country tour. They leave Colorado and they make their word their way to Texas where he starts threatening Rita saying that he would shoot her in the head and abandons her there. I had also read in another source that Rita actually left him because he wouldn't stop checking out other women. Mm. That's what I seen. He was like a ladies' man, and Rita was like, "I'm too high Um, for this shit." Excuse me, (laughs) what are you doing? You don't see this filet mignon in front of you? You looking at chicken tenders? Chicken tenders, Mm. dino nuggets. I know that's right, Rita. (laughs) Know your worth, queen. Absolutely. However, it ended. He soon found another partner in crime. Thirty-two-year-old Sarah Clark would literally be his partner slash accomplice in crime. She was a waitress that he charmed and came up with a a story about how he was jumped by a group of bikers and couldn't work because he was going to lose his apartment. And how could he be homeless? Uh, How would would that possibly happen? Oh, my God. So she lets him move in with her and he convinces her to quit her job so that they can travel the country together. So it's kind of his huh? thing that he does. He charms his way into their life. He's like, let's get away together. Let's travel the country. Apparently that works. So they also took another hostage by the name of Pamela Jackson. She was a 23-year-old dental assistant and single mom living in Corpus Christi, Texas. She was repeatedly raped, and they kept her as a hostage for weeks. He tells Sarah that she was one of the girlfriends of one of the bikers, that beat him and Sarah goes along with it. She's like, okay. She helps Morin drug her while he continues to rape and keep her gagged and bound. They also dye Pamela's hair so she's not as recognizable. Pamela would later tell authorities that after she was raped, Morin would tell her that he cared for her and she would go home soon, but he wasn't sure when. Mm -hmm. Morin, during this time, finds more time to kill another victim on December 2nd. 21-year-old Jana Bruce, who is a hotel receptionist. Her body is found having been strangled three hours away on South Padre Island, and he takes her car. So by this time, Sarah, Pamela, and Stephen Morin are back on the road with Jana's car. Uh, Sarah would later admit that she agreed to prostitute herself for money so that they could have money for motels, drugs, and alcohol. They go to San Antonio, and he finds another victim, 21-year-old Carrie Marie Scott, outside of Maggie's restaurant where she worked. According to Morin, apparently, he was just trying to steal her car, and she approached him. He then shot her and her friend, and her body was found in the restaurant parking lot in San Antonio. And that's the one he claimed, I didn't want to kill her. She made right. me kill her. I didn't like, want to what? kill her. You she still made in my car. me. It's like, Why you, would I not run up on you, right, fool? And you pulled the trigger on her. What were you thinking? Was if you going pull a gun happen? to somebody and you're trying to steal their car, most likely they're gonna back up and be like, "Oh, okay, it's yours, big man. You can have it." I mean, right. I said he was a little shit. <laughs> now you he's just a big shit. That. You did say that. True that. Ugh. So um, after this, the police are finally on his trail and they track him down to the motel where he's staying with. Sarah and Pamela. They get to the hotel and they arrest Sarah and Pamela since they didn't know that Pamela was actually a hostage at the time. Unfortunately, Morin got away and escaped from the hotel just in time before the police got there. The very next day, so Stephen leaves. He's like traveling by bus. He's trying to 
figure out what to do next. The next day, he abducts another woman by the name of Margie Mayfield. And this is a whole other story with Margie. Like, we could do a whole other story on Margie, okay? This would end up being his last victim, but he ends up taking her hostage in a Kmart parking lot. Um, he takes her hostage in her own car with her as the passenger. Margie says that she ended up speaking Bible verses to him and praying for him, and he eventually let her go. Like, she, she started just turning him over to the word of God and, and Jesus Christ. And mm -hmm. and there's a whole like 45 minute story on YouTube where she's doing an interview on a religious show and talking about how he, she, she turned him into this religious man. And during this hostage situation, he actually pulls over in her car and he puts his hands up and he's like, forgive me God for everything I've done and, and all this stuff. And he asks her like, are you an angel? <laughs> it's a whole story. It's this ties into what I'm about to talk about, too. <laughs> Girl, shut the fuck up. Right. So, um, they listen. They also listen to Kenneth Copeland tapes. So if you know anything about Kenneth Copeland, that's a joke. Um, apparently, he asked her if she was an angel. And after he was dropped off at a bus station. So there's a, a whole thing where this Margie lady says she had premonitions. Like, I saw... I saw in my mind these blockades and I knew that we shouldn't go to this city. And I said out of nowhere, we should go to Kerrville. And he's like, okay, I'll go with what you say. So they end up going to Kerrville and she gets him a plane or a, not a plane ticket, a bus ticket to San Antonio. No, mm -hmm. Fort Worth. Mm. She gets him a plane ticket or a bus ticket to Fort Worth. And it's a whole thing. We could do a whole show on it, on this and I would be happy to because it's ridiculous. Um, after he was dropped off at that bus station, Margie went back home and she told her husband all about the day she had with this murderer. Uh, apparently, her husband was like playing golf with the owners of Maggie's restaurant. So he knew all about what had happened the previous day. And she was like, I was with that guy. I told him all about God. And he he had me, you know. He had me drop him off at the bus station. So her husband calls the cops and tells the cops about what happened. So they catch him at the bus station. Apparently the the route from Kerrville to Fort Worth, there was a stop in Austin, Texas. Mm -hmm. And um, they had intercepted him at Austin, Texas, where they finally arrested him. Um, and that's where we move on to the actual catching of him and, and and so on and so forth <laughs> so like christina said they ended up catching him uh trying to board a greyhound trying to get the hell out of dodge right now remember sarah from the gas station we talked about sarah sarah and sherry sarah now sarah ended up moving to texas with her sister and she was kind of in police hiding while peter was still out on the loose she mm -hmm. went there so she could be protected he actually ends up calling her sister's house one day and he's like i know where you are you're not safe i'm gonna kill you She's like, ain't nobody told me shit. How you find my new address, right? So she's terrified. The police end up telling her they think that she was his motivation for even going to Texas in the first place. He was so obsessed with killing Sarah that he made Texas his last stop because he was trying to get close mm -hmm. to Sarah right before he ended up getting captured. So it's a good thing that he got caught because he would have went on to kill Sarah. We all know that. So Morin ends up... Um, he was convicted in two separate trials for the murders of Carrie Scott, uh, Yana Bruce, both in Texas. And he also went on to get convicted for the murder of Sheila Whalen in Colorado. Now, what's crazy is that in Utah, they were actually going to convict him for the murder of Sherry Daniels, which we know for sure he did. He starts stalking her friend after. But they retracted due to the convictions in Texas holding. He had already he was on his way to be convicted to life or to death I should say so they like I ah, don't even bring them out here just let Texas handle it right mm -hmm. now the police end up finding so many fake identities in the San Antonio hotel that they suspect that he's killed a lot more women than we even know about mm -hmm. but there was insufficient evidence to charge him now he had been on the run since 1969 pretty much killing people uh, and he was able to hide behind countless identities now once he made it to fbi's most wanted list it took them four years to catch him 
FBI, everybody out there, and they still couldn't find this man in four years. That's how skilled he was. And if you go online and look at some of his uh, aliases, I could see why. If you're not checking for it, it's easy to look at somebody. He's like, this is not the same man. Mm -hmm. He He was real different. Even somehow his nose looks different in so many pictures. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Now, during this time, we can only imagine how many people he truly killed. I mean, you got a man on the loose with literally nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. So he ended up pleading guilty to four counts of murder, like I said. But he is linked to killing as many as 48 people and even during that time when the cops were showing Sarah all of his pictures they said that they knew for a fact he had killed at least 44 women and seven men at this time he's also suspected of killing in nine different states now he went on to become only the second man in Texas to plead guilty to capital murder which pretty much means sealing his fate he's like oh capital murder I know I'm going to get the death penalty at this point now his lawyer Pete Torres said Morin's newfound faith was a significance uh, in his decision to plead guilty and withdraw all appeals. Now get this. She was talking about how the woman, the the man, Morin's like, are you an angel? Mm -hmm. While he's in prison, he received a degree in biblical teachings. He went on to lead Bible study groups to the other prisoners. And his one of his last visitors was a preacher. Kenneth Copeland. Ain't that some shit? Who came to baptize, baptize little Peter Morin. Ugh. Right? Came to baptize him. Freaking kidding me. Now, he began uh, to look forward to his execution, everybody around him said. He mm-hmm. referred to the date as his graduation day. Yeah. On his actual uh, execution day, he's joking around. He's like in a good mood. He's saying, this was a great day. On the day of his execution. Right, he's saying shit like, you sure you want to do this? We could just go fishing. Yeah, he, he's cracking Weird jokes. He's, he's cracking. Hey, good to see you again, my man. Want to hang me? Like, he's having a good time on execution day, right? Mm-hmm. Now, a friend of his, Charles Galloway. How does he have a friend? I know, right? A friend of his, <laughs> uh, Charles Galloway, he said, Morin knew he was guilty and was accepting of whatever the judge thought he deserved. He was a changed man. And if the Lord wanted him to remain on earth or go home to heaven, He was willing. So after all this, they still think this man is going off to heaven, right? His attorney, again, Torres, he said that he remained quiet on the other suspected murders. He even told him, honestly, he had no recollection of any crimes he may have committed. And it was as though that part of his life had been blanked from his memory. Now, one would argue... Morin was a heavy drug user. So it is possible, not not that he's killed uh, 50 people and forgot about it, but it is possible that he did black out for a mm-hmm. portion of these killings. So you could show him some people and he couldn't remember, but I highly doubt you blacked out, blacked out, I should say, oh, I for 48 uh-huh. murders. Mm-hmm. Highly doubt that. He probably was also using his newfound religion as an excuse. Like, yeah. I cannot speak about these things. I am now I've, a I'm child forgiven. of God. Mm-hmm. I, I cannot... You know, that's that was another life. And this is my new life. And I will not discuss those things. Now, at the tender age of 34, Stephen Peter Morin was executed on March 13th, 1985 at 1255 a.m. by lethal injection. He became the sixth man to be executed in Texas since they started using lethal injections in 1982. Fun fact, when they tried to execute uh, him, it took them 40 minutes to hit a vein because he was such a heavy drug user. They were all collapsed and shit. They couldn't find a vein. Couldn't find his vein. They just poking his man. Can somebody get in here and find his man vein? 40 minutes to find a vein just to kill him. Mm -mm. Now, Morin's last words were a prayer, of course. He's a born-again Christian, as we Mm. know, going to heaven. See you you up there when I get there. Um, And the prayer that he decided to say... Heavenly Father, I give thanks for this time, for the time that we have been together. The fellowship in your world, the Christian family presented to me. At this point, he calls out the names of the personal witnesses. Allow your Holy Spirit to flow as I know your love has uh, been showered upon me. Forgive them, not him, forgive them. They about to murder me. Forgive them for they know not what they do as I know that you have forgiven me, as I have forgiven them. Lord Jesus, I commit my soul to you. I praise you and I thank you. (laughs) (laughs) And that, my Mm. friends, is the story of Stephen Peter Morin. That's some bullshit. Forgotten serial killer. (laughs) 
<laughs> that you may have never heard of until Some today. Bullshit. <laughs> little oh. shit. Uh, he is a little <laughs> shit. Now, if you guys will recall, um, all season we did a cold-hearted question. This year we're going to open it up. If you guys have a cold-hearted question you want to ask us, it doesn't even have to go with the episode. If you just want to be nosy and know how deep and dark we can be, send mm-hmm. us a question. You know, comment mm-hmm. on our social medias. We love to answer it. Today's cold-hearted question, we have no idea what it's going to be. Rachel about to pull this out of her pooper scooper. About to be a surprise. Uh, <laughs> pooper so, scooper. Hit it, Rach. Woo. Okay. Here's my cold-hearted question. <clears throat> Would you be able to forgive Stephen Peter Morin for killing any of your family members just because he is a born-again Christian? Mm, I want to answer this first. So anybody that knows me knows that I am a firm believer. I don't care if you are family, friends, if you're giving me a, a, a kidney. If you wrong me so harshly that it makes me think that I need to kick you out of my life, I don't care to forgive you. And I hate when people say, well, forgiveness is for you. No, no, I'm not walking around with hate <clears> and <throat> anger, but I don't have to forgive you for shit. I am firm on that. You can for, you can apologize until you're blue in the face. That does not mean that I have to turn around and then say, I accept. You can sit there and bow down in front of as many altars as you want to. That doesn't have to mean that I have to say, I believe you a changed man. So hell no, I'm not forgiving Peter. And I will spend the rest of my life every day cursing his soul, hoping that he is not living in peace in the afterlife because you decided after you've killed all these people and ruined countless lives and affected hundreds of people from their their senseless murders that now I, I'm a changed man so I, I am deserving of your forgiveness. I deserve your forgiveness. No. Yes. I don't have to give you shit. I'm not a Christian woman so I don't go to my grave with that I forgive everybody. No, you made no. me mad. You sit there and you lie in that now. I hate you for the rest of my life. Period. What about you? Yeah. I've I've never been a Christian. Um, it's I've never, never been, been a Christian. We it's know. never been something that <laughs> That speaks to me. And I understand if that's something that, you know, other people believe in, that's that's fine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, even when I was young, like I was five years old, my, my dad sent me to a Catholic school. And I remember even being five years old and being in church and being like, why am I here? Like, can I can I not? So I was there for one year and I, w- I was out. I was put in public school. So <laughs> um, it, it's just not something that speaks to me. And. Even if he believes in his heart that he is a born again Christian, it doesn't change what he did. And it's not going to change the way I feel towards him. And another thing is that he's an extremely, extremely manipulative person. Mm -hmm. He knows how to work his way into people's lives. He knows Mm -hmm. how to say what he needs Mm -hmm. to say in order to get what he needs. And he just Mm -hmm. happened to be in Texas at the time. And he was definitely looking for Sarah Pison. He just happened to think, you know what? Yeah, maybe I want to go meet Kenneth Copeland now. Maybe I'll go with whatever this chick is saying. He, Everything that he did was just a step on the way to whatever his goal was in his head. Exactly. So, hell no. Uh, to answer my own question, <laughs> um, I have been told that I'm a very forgiving person. Mm, too forgiving. <laughs> I've been told I've, I'm forgiving, but when it comes to something like that, um, I think I have to take into consideration everything. And you did that on purpose. You did what you did <clears throat> on purpose. And just because you found a a uh, a new path for yourself. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that I have to walk down that path with you. Mm-mm. Nope. Um, that's your path. Your. And that's literally your path uh, to make you feel like you're righteous again. Yeah. I think it was more about yourself. Any, then. Right. It don't have anything to do with me. Mm. So, um, like, I loved this person to no end or whatever. And then you decided to kill them for whatever reason you wanted to kill them for. That's 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 your reason. And I love them for my reason. And I'm not going to forgive you for my reason. Yep. Um, I'm pretty sure, like, a lot of people that know how forgiving I am will probably be surprised as I say that. But 
that's what that is. Um, you did what you did on purpose because mm-hmm. you didn't have to kill them. You didn't have to do that. These people that you killed, that, that he killed, was for absolutely no reason. He didn't have no reason to, to, uh, to kill them. So I don't have any reason to forgive you. Right. So yeah, there I mean, it is. Three. Three votes against uh, uh, four. We we would never forgive Peter. <laughs> now, isn't that like a first for us? Like, yeah, we never we agree on everything so. across the board. I agree, yeah. I think so. So, I mean, if you're one of those people, now don't just do it because you're one of those miserable people who just like conflict in your life. If you genuinely are one of those people who would be able to forgive Peter, let us know why. Yeah. Don't just go creating stuff because you want to stand out. Like, if you, <laughs> if you agree with us, then tell us you agree. But if you are one of those people who could forgive, let us know why. I love hearing about stories from people who are willing to forgive because although I don't have that forgiving spirit I still appreciate hearing about people mm. who are forgiving yeah because yeah. I, I will cut my own parents all my life let me I, tell w- you. I would like to understand how other people think in a different way yeah absolutely I'm definitely stuck on my way and I understand how other people can think a different way but it would be nice to really understand yeah. and hear your thoughts what we're saying is this is a safe space yes yeah, <laughs> we are definitely a safe space <laughs> no matter what space. you say yeah, we would never safe. attack you for it. For sure. Well, not we shouldn't say no matter because I attack <laughs> you on a few issues, but this one oh, be one of them. Um, hey, if you want to forgive him, forgive him, but right. I'm not. Mm-mm. Nope. Nope. So, guys, that is the story of Stephen Peter Morin. All right. Ugh. And that brings us to the end of episode one, season two. All Ooh. right. Now, isn't that hey, cute? Now. That's season cute or whatever. two. <laughs> uh, make sure guys as always like comment subscribe hit us up in our DM not DMs hit us well you can hit us up on the you DMs could. we like a little kinky hit if us up want. in our DMs I'm on not our answer. wall I might answer you you know Tasha what I'm saying I'll be bored me. some nights we'll refer them to Tasha uh huh send them my way <laughs> I got some twerking videos I got a kinky one for you um like I said on our if you're not following us on Facebook you're missing some great content um, I did upload a video on Facebook letting you guys know we are opening up season 2 to bring in on guest co-hosts next week if all goes as planned we will have our first guest co-host uh, in the building with us if you've ever listened to our show and thought I like these weird ass girls I want to do this hit us up we would love to bring you on to talk about one of these crazy uh, notorious serial killers uh, with us alright so is that it, everybody? Y'all got anything y'all want to add? I'm not forgiving fucking Peter. Oh. We oh. love you long time. We do love you sometime. <laughs> <laughs> we love you at some times. No, we love you all the time. Well, we I love you all time. see, you see how funny acting they are? You see how funny acting they are? Oh, I damn. love you sometimes. You serious? I love you long time. I do. <laughs> I am Natasha Carr with Rachel Cherie and Christina Mata. Flirting with Darkness. Continue to promote weird brown girl joy. We love you long time. Bye. Enjoy your evening. Peace.